scenery has changed. Now there's no one on stage because of uh, PowerPoint. All right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege and honor to be here in this uh, uh, morning symposium for, for Professor Lloyd. Um, and I would not uh, dare uh, try to say something very substantive about, uh, very substantial about the, uh, uh, the, the question of the dichotomy between nature and nurture as it is reflected uh, in the history of ideas. Uh, about that I can only learn from you but I think I can say something uh, that might be significant about some stuff that's happening to the dichotomy today uh, in um, the, the uh, set of fields uh, within which I've been uh, working, especially with respect to the question of language, the question of the essence of language, the evolution of language, and uh, where language stands. Um, um, around that dichotomy uh, between nature and nurture. So I would like to say a few, a few words about that. Um, actually, a few notes. Uh, the first, which I think Eva is going to talk about a little bit more, um, and it, something that comes very, very strongly from out of our work together on the evolution of language, uh, is that it may be the case um, that something slightly different is happening to the dichotomy as opposed to um, a continuous effort of deconstruction. Uh, actually what is happening is some sort of causal reversal between these two terms. And in a way, it seems like the dichotomy is coming back to becoming a little bit more clear once we put it uh, uh, in the reverse order, uh, in the following sense that I think a, 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 a major part of the way discourse over this dichotomy has taken place in the West was to start with a certain meta-theoretical um, assumption that says there's something that we can call human nature and that is it is um, um, the, the causal basis of whatever there is uh, in the human sphere it is uh, universal and it is given this way or the other and we do not know how and so on. And then we can talk about all kinds of cultural facts uh, as resulting, again, this way or the other, from these things. So for example, whereas um, the assumption would be that other things being equal, we would like to think of nature as something that is simply, sh nature as something that is simply shared by all humans in some kind of universal way. We would say, okay, on the basis of that, we can have variable phenomena such as cultural phenomena. In the last 50 years in the investigation of language, this has been uh, um, the, the position and it, it's been uh, formulated in very, very radical terms by Noam Chomsky and, and Jerry Fodor and, and uh, um, a whole group of very influential thinkers. Um, and I think that, uh, yes, uh, part of what has happened uh, was that a lot of people tried to show that the dichotomy doesn't work. And I think that everything the people have done in, in this sense uh, was extremely valuable, both in terms of uh, looking, for example, at the question of how we get to know language. No, it's not the case that there's this genetically given uh, universal grammar that we all share, um, uh, which then allows for the diversification of language uh, something much more complicated is happening in language acquisition in terms of the relationship between the child and the environment, and the environments are different, and so on and so forth. All kinds of very interesting stuff. But the kind of idea that um, uh, Eva and I are pushing towards, and other people are also pushing towards, um, uh, is actually uh, uh, the idea of uh, causal reversal in the following sense. Whatever we think about as human nature is actually to a very large extent a result of a cultural process that created at every point along the way uh, new uh, selection regimes for individuals uh, which means that in the long run uh, the way we are in terms of our biological nature, our genetically given nature, Eva will talk about epigenetics and, and the whole thing, in a very serious sense, this may actually be the result 
of the fact that we've been living in, in, in cultural scenarios for a very, very long time, and that we as individuals, generation by generation, have been selected in terms of our capacity to actually meet the challenges of society, of culture. Uh, so um, looking at the relationship between culture and uh, nature in this way, uh, first of all, helps a lot in explaining all kinds of stuff that I will not get into uh, in here. But it also changes some of the most, um, I think, basic parameters of these ideas of what culture is, what nature is, and, and, and how we think about the, 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 the separation or the dichotomy or the relationship. The first uh, thing that comes to mind has to do with universality and variability, a very, very important um, parameter uh, in, in this discussion. And again, in the last 50 years, we've gone through a pretty dramatic um, um, path. Uh, for example, uh, the, the general assumption uh, 50 years ago, again, a Chomskyan assumption, uh, was uh, because language is given to us in our genes, because it is part of our nature way before it has become involved in culture, um, whatever is natural about the human linguistic capacity should be uh, the same for all human beings. Uh, so linguistic capacity at the, at the level of nature is universal. Uh, then uh, we can find all kinds of variabilities between language, but at the end of the day, these variabilities are going to be at the margins. They are going to be phenomena that have grown uh, wild uh, to this extent or the other on the basis of something that is shared by everybody in all languages. Uh, what we know today, after 50 years of, of work, that was um, actually paradoxically, or maybe not paradoxically, inspired very deeply by Chomsky's contentions. And uh, no one would uh, 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 do the kind of work that typologists are doing today, uh, really going through sets of 800 or 1,000 languages looking for common denominators and so on, if it weren't the case that Chomsky put on the table such a very radical idea saying behind all languages it's just the same thing. So what we know today about languages, uh, for example, goes exactly with what you were saying uh, before. Actually the most impressive fact about human language is the extent to which it is diverse and variable. That is one of the most important differences between the human capacity for language and other animals' capacity for other systems of communication is the extent to which our communication system language, just one of the communication systems that we use, but this system is so variable. There's something very, very um, um, deep in the fact that we can have such variable languages. In the fact, for example, uh, that uh, many, many, many of the languages of the world uh, are spoken by uh, 5,000 people, less or more, uh, very small languages. For a very long time, this has been thought of as a sort of fluke, right? Uh, but I think that we're now gradually learning that the essence of things is exactly there. Uh, the essence of language lies in the fact that you, you, you take a bunch of people and you put them together and you create a situation where they constantly have to uh, uh, engage in dialogue over what would be a consensual worldview with which they can work and talk and, and, and communicate and, and the kind of uh, thing that comes out of this process is always locally unique, is always something that reflects something very, very deep about the people and the place and so on uh, and, and, and is in some kind of dialectical relationship with, with that community. All right? uh, we know today, for example, uh, at a different level, that uh, the most important, or one of the most important facts about language acquisition uh, is its variability. Uh, 50 years ago and in certain quarters until today, the idea is that children come into the world and go through the process of language acquisition just in exactly the same way because they are kind of programmed uh, to go through stages of this type or the other. And we now know more and more that different children 
uh, come into this process of language acquisition with different strategies, different ideas about what they should be doing there, different variabilities between their capacities, and children look for all kinds of different ways to meet the challenge of language, which is always the, the, the social challenge, the cult cultural challenge. It's, it's out there. Uh, in a real sense, um, we can actually say uh, something like uh, the following. What is universal in the first place about human language? The, the, the most foundational question from that perspective. And, and it's been uh, always totally assumed that when we're asking this question, we're talking about the mind-brain in this way or the other. So it doesn't matter what happens elsewhere. Uh, the fact of the matter is that every human being has language, every human child is capable of acquiring language at a certain point in time. This is the foundation. Uh, but now I think we're gradually coming to terms with the understanding, which is almost shocking in its simplicity, uh, that whereas uh, there are human individuals with language and human individuals with less language and some human individuals without language at all, for each of which we have a good excuse, right? Uh, so we say here's the uh, cognitive problem and here's the brain problem and here's the fact that this child has never been exposed to language in the critical ages and so on. There is no human society without language. We don't need excuses there, all right? Uh, the 100%, the, the, the foolproof journalization about the universality of language uh, lies at the social, cultural level and not at the individual level. This reframes the whole question of linguistically related capacity. Uh, what does it mean that some people find it more difficult to cope with language uh, than others? It means totally something totally different if we position language at the social domain and then we ask, or cultural, and then we ask how different individuals manage to meet this challenge uh, to, to, uh, to variable degrees. Uh, for me, uh, in terms of my own understanding of language, my theory of language as a communication technology, uh, the most important element in all this, uh, which I think is in a way, I think directly related to your great interest in, in, in the, the, the meaning of concepts in different cultures, um, is, is the idea that when we want to ask the question of what is happening to language and with language in a community of individuals, we're actually, we, we, we actually have to start not from the universality of the linguistic capacity, not even from the variability of what is happening at the cultural and, 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 and uh, social level. We actually have to start with the variability between the individuals who are part of the, com of the language community. First thing to note is here is a bunch of people uh, who are looking at the world in slightly different ways, who have gone through different biographies, who know different things about what is happening around them, who have experienced different things with different people in different circumstances and so on. Okay? So potentially, uh, each of these individuals lives in an experiential world that is in very many important ways different from all the others. And language from this point of view is actually a very sophisticated tool that we use in order to create some sort of common view of the world within the community. So language as a cultural phenomenon is actually playing the role of a unifying element within a community of individuals who without language would be more different from each other. Again, other things being equal, we always have to say that because there are many, many elements uh, involved there. One of the things that uh, would happen immediately if uh, we all uh, at this very moment stopped speaking, writing, talking to each other, giving advice, telling each other stories and so on, uh, assume that we could do everything else exactly the same way. And I totally sympathize with what you're saying, what you were saying before. I think it's an, a very, very important issue. Human culture, human civilization, human sociality is not only language-based, and in many, many deep ways, it's based on other things, and language is a pretty late development that already builds 
for example, on all the capacities of intersubjectivity that are involved in doing things together, like chopping uh, 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 stone tools, uh, and most of the tools you showed, I think up to the last version of the Achillean uh, tools, um, were probably made before language as we know it came into play. So there's a lot of stuff that we are capable of doing together without language. Very important to remember that. But assume that now we, we were banned from using language altogether. We just couldn't do that. Okay? I think that one of the things that would immediately uh, come up in our um, uh, subjective um, experience of the world would be uh, we would feel the experiential gaps between us uh, much more uh, radically. Uh, we uh, give us a, 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 a certain time of not being able to talk to each other and the understanding of how different we are would uh, become stronger in many ways and language as a system, as a technology is uh, designed, that's the theory that I'm developing, is designed by cultural evolution to systematically allow us to find common denominators in our worldviews and discuss them and create the sort of socially grounded view of the world that then allows for all the beautiful things that we're doing and also for all the horrible things that we're doing as human beings that we couldn't do without language and so on. We're creating a, a sense of collective epistemology uh, through a system that allows us to systematically work together on the bridging of the experiential gaps between us. And, and this has uh, implications for all kinds of uh, issues, and of course I'm not going to have uh, time to talk about all of them. I would just want to make one uh, last uh, remark about uh, uh, something that I think is coming out very, very strongly in Professor Lloyd's uh, uh, work, and that is the, the relationship between um, this conceptual analysis and historical and anthropological analysis of concepts and the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. To what extent can we learn something of importance about the relationship between the way we use our language and the way uh, we actually think about the world? Uh, there's also always an implicit assumption behind textual analysis uh, that we have a certain view of that. Uh, because otherwise, for example, if we assume there is no relationship between language and thought, the textual analysis would be of a diff diff totally different type. And uh, uh, what is happening from all, uh, what is coming out from all this um, uh, work, together with a lot of new work that's coming out uh, on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, uh, is a situation where it seems that as humans, one of the things that makes us unique is that we have different levels at which we learn about the world and we learn at all these different levels simultaneously and most importantly the different levels don't give us the same answers. So if we uh, experience the world on our own or with people without language, uh, with, with the people that we're living with uh, in our daily lives uh, and so on, uh, just like all the other animals with a, with a, with a, a central nervous system, we learn about what is going on. We make generalizations in our heads. We learn from experience what to do, what not to do, what is good, what is bad, and so on. Uh, the uh, uh, conceptual system that comes with language, which is a result of a, an entire historical process of experiential mutual identification between individuals in the community, gives us a different, um, um, uh, a different system. It is sometimes similar to what we've experienced, and it is sometimes not. And to the extent that it is similar to the world of our experiences, we find it more easy, comfortable to use the language when uh, it is uh, uh, further away from the way we experience certain elements are more difficult to use and so on. But we live in different epistemic worlds which are only partially um, uh, correlated with each other. And in this sense, we can start talking about different scenarios in which, for example, in, in some of which uh, language would very much strengthen the way we would look at the world experientially regardless of language. In some cases, language would educate us to look at the world through a certain conceptual uh, prism uh, and thus influence the way we actually experience, hence a Sapir-Whorf phenomenon. In some cases, 
language would simply uh, tell us something about the world that contradicts whatever we know experientially. And in this kind of situation, we would either uh, fall into a very problematic emotional situation. A lot of what psychologists do in therapy is exactly about that, finding of some way to uh, uh, do something about the gap between the way we feel and the way we're supposed to formulate our feelings in a language that's not ours. Uh, sometimes uh, we would uh, throw, out, throw away our experiences in favor of language. Sometimes we would let our experiences help us invent new means of language to change language so that it would look more like the way we think and we get this entire process of change uh, that is very, very important in the whole story. Thank you very much.